Hi, I'm Rob Cosin. Welcome to my shop. This is episode of eight, eight of our coronavirus drawer making daily series. And we had a little few snafus this week with some problems with our mic. We uh, fortunately is under warranty, so we got a, a replacement. Um, we're working on the drawer on our on our standing desk, but I wanted to start each episode with showing you some other drawers that I've made. Now the last one was a small set of drawers, and so is this one. This is a, uh, a wall-mounted jewelry chest that I made for my wife. And it's got eight drawers in it. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. I'll show you the whole thing first. Made out of walnut with bird's eye maple. So if you look on the side, actually the, uh, kind of designed it as we went and added some things to it that changed a few issues. But I'll show you that too. Dovetails on the case. It uses a wood hinge. So this is a variation of the wood hinge that I do on my boxes. So that opens up. That, that obviously is the same piece of wood, just split. In this side, you have a place to keep all of your necklaces. And instead of having to fumble through, you can just take that out. That's a little bird's eye maple holder I turned on the lathe. The interior is all leather. That's actually Gaboon Ebony in the back, but that's a long story. Turned all the knobs on the lathe. They're all turned out of bird's eye. And then we have these eight drawers. So what I did with the drawers that was unique is I took a flitch of bird's eye maple. So a flitch is where they cut a log and they cut it into slices. They keep them all in sequence and you buy it like that. So you'll notice that that piece looks identical from top to bottom. Now I didn't cheat but I'll tell you how I had to do that. Because the veneer that I had was in veneer form, what I did was I made the, uh, made the drawer with a regular piece of maple and then that veneer wasn't thin enough to give me an appropriate sized end lap. Thick enough, sorry. So I had to put two pieces together. But if you have a good glue joint and you glue two pieces of wood, that be two pieces of wood together, that becomes one piece. So these are uh, dovetailed on the half blinds, although they really were through dovetails with an added front. So it looks like a half blind and through in the back. The uh, bottoms were plywood sitting in a groove on three sides. Why does that say, yeah, that's eight, that's the bottom. And then we, we uh, customize each one. So what I did here, this is a piece of leather. The, the round portion is just foam um, weather stripping. And then if you look in there, there's a little brass rod, eighth inch brass rod that holds each one of these separate. And it's a nice place to hold your rings. Uh, what do we do in this one? This one was just leather bottomed. It's nicer to drop stuff into a box or a drawer that has a leather bottom rather than a wood. Deadens the sound a little, makes it a little classier. This one has a little sliding tray, and of course, if you're going to dovetail, everything has to be dovetailed. That's made out of, um, what cedar was that, Jake? Yellow cedar. Smells nice. There's a drawer stop right here so that all of the drawers close to the same point. This one is just another... Leather bottom, that one was too. This one we put a one to be able to have it for, uh, I forget what these things call them, but they're bracelets of some sort. And then when you're done with it, you put it in there. Oops, there it goes, just drops down. And that one just has a little set of dividers to give you four equal spaces. There's actually another tray that sits on top of that. I had to take it out because it was it had just a little bit too tight and it was making the drawer fit too tight. What else can I show? So if you look at the back, this is where things changed. Initially, it didn't, wasn't going to have this frame on it, but then I wanted to mount it to the wall, so I had to figure out a way to do that. And in mounting that frame on there, I didn't have room to put it back in. doesn't matter anyway because it's went up against the wall. That serves as a back. Your back is primarily to keep dust out. This has a French cleat, so there's a negative slope on this. So there's a matching piece of wood that you screw to your wall and then put this on, and the French cleat holds it. And then I put one screw down there just to keep it from being knocked about. But it attaches nice and clean. You don't see any fasteners. And she loved it. All right, let me get this cleaned up, and then we'll get on to our episode working on the drawer. Okay, we're just getting ready to start. And I was looking at this and thinking, ah. Now, first of all, I've got to show you what you're looking at. Jake, where's my headgear that we went out to get? Okay, so here's what you're looking at, just in case you're not sure. This, these two lines are just nicks in the blade. Now, you can't even feel them. Well, you can barely, but they'll, be, they'll get planed out. This is my back line. This is the end lap line. See how far away I am, some of these? I want to be a whole lot closer than that. 
and you'll see why when we start to cut them. So um, I'll do this off camera just because you've already seen it done. We'll just turn the camera back on as we're nearing the end. But I'm just going to go back and do the exact same thing, put it back into place, and that should drop it right exactly where it was. Okay. Now you see how closer we are to the line. I'm going to actually go ahead and I'm going to cut this one right now so we can kind of uh, break up the monotony of seeing the same process multiple times. Now this piece is thick enough and stiff enough that it's fine without a backer board. And the reason I say that is because in order to make these cuts, I can only saw from this baseline to that end lap line. So I've got to be able to saw like this and I need to have room. So I have to have this board sticking up out of the vise a whole lot more than I normally would, which means it has a tendency to vibrate, but that's thick enough, it'll be all right. If it was a thinner piece, I would actually put another piece of wood behind it and clamp it to it, in addition to holding it in the vise, and that would stiffen it up. Now, I wanna go in and uh, put our lines down the face, which gives you something to follow. Um, I'm gonna use a, what have I got for a pen? Oh, I've got one here in my pocket, a blue one. Okay, let's identify our waste. So this is being removed and then down the face as well. So I'm keeping this piece on the, on the right. So when I draw my line, I'm going to draw my line to engage that side of the kerf. In this case, I'm going to do it on this side of the kerf. Or at least try to. That way, instead of sawing through your line, I didn't get that one where I want it. Let's see if I can't get one out of the six. Instead of sawing through your line, you're sawing beside the line. Okay, so here's the big advantage to this. Put that right in the kerf, light touch. And try to go from there to there. And if you do this with a light enough touch, that is enough kerf to actually engage and hold the blade plumb. So you don't even have to pay attention to the line I just drew because the uh, kerf will hold the saw and you'll make a nice plumb cut. All I'm using, doing is essentially preventing it from falling on the floor, but I'm using the web up between my thumb and my index finger, pushed up against the horn like that just to move the saw forward instead of grasping it and possibly throwing it off. And it's not a whole lot of kerf to engage your saw, but as I said, if your touch is light enough, or your grip is light enough, it's enough. Too many enoughs in that sentence. Okay. Let's go ahead and have a real close look at that. Everything looks just dandy. Okay, now I'm going to use something called my Kerf X10, fancy name. Okay, in case you've never seen this before, let me explain how it works because it could be a mystery. I was only able to cut from there to there, yet I've got to go in and I essentially have to make, uh, use a pencil. I have to finish, sorry, this. So that cut has to go all the way down and out here. Well, it used to be that you had to carve all that out with a chisel. And the problem is that you would, when you got it mostly removed, 
you'd come in with a chisel and you'd be paring along that wall like this to try to get the last of it. And it was too easy to end up taking some of the pin off and then there goes your fit. Hello gap. Well, this is a technique that was taught to me by Tay Frid back in the 80s. And what we're going to do is we're going to use, I just turned it into a tool, a little easier to handle. So that kerf is 24 thousandths of an inch wide, which is my, as I explained, it's my dovetail saw blade, which is 20 thou and two thou set on either side. This kerf is 25 thou wide. It's blunt, there's no teeth, it's squared off. And I'm gonna put it in here and I'm gonna pound that down through the wood and it will just push the fiber straight down. It's quite amazing. Because it's 25 thou, it'll leave that wall lovely and clean. Otherwise, you sometimes would end up having, if it was narrower, you'd have a little ridge on there where the saw kerf stopped. And then you've gotta go in and get rid of that, which is almost as the same problem you had resurfacing. So the reason I've got a clamp is if I, I've only had the only time I've ever had a problem with this was on the outside half pins. And if your grain was sloping off like that, sometimes it didn't take much to cause that to split. So what you can do is go in here and just put a clamp right at the base, just as a precaution. And now let me show you, I'm going to use a mallet to drive this in. I always, well, I'll do the inside ones first. These ones I can do in two steps. So the first one, I'm going to uh, go halfway. Like I said, get it started by hand so you're not accidentally driving it into your pin. And then tap it. And go right, right to your baseline. And pull it out. And now I'm going to put it right to the back, right to the, uh, the end lap. And then do the same thing right to the bottom. Come over here and start it by hand. Now I emphasize that I do it in two stages because on the outside ones I'll do it in four stages just as a precaution against possibly splitting that off. Oh. Now I get these ones I'll put that back on before I do it. Make sure you go right to the bottom. If you don't, it almost defeats the purpose. What you want to avoid is having to come in there with a chisel and start paring on that side of the pin. And you do need to be conscious of the grain. If it's really angling off, then you've got to take some precautions. And don't squeeze too much. And don't if you come up too high, you're going to squeeze those in and you're not going to be able to get the Kerf X10 in there. So I actually stay at or below the baseline. Final one goes right to the back. Now, if you're thinking that's not such a big deal, then you haven't cut half blinds before because the process of cleaning out these sockets is a very time consuming big deal. Time, Jake? 14 and a half. That's all? Including that thing we did at the beginning? Oh, awesome. We'll get more done. All right, let's go ahead and finish this one. Now, lost, the rest of this is just a lot of chopping, but I have another tool that is a, a big game changer when the handle stays on. That's why I like the IBC. Handles don't fall off. 
So there's the shape. And what that's going to allow me to do is get right into the corner with one tool and it doesn't change my line of force. Let me actually get there before I explain it to you. Okay. I need to chop all that out, so I'm going to use a heavier mallet because it's a fair bit of work. Um, I prefer to use a narrower chisel than a wide one just because it requires less effort because you're not chopping as much material. So our first chop is going to be right about here, and then we'll come in at about the same amount until we're right at the back line. Now my first chop is going to only go to about here. And then after I get in about one third of the distance, so by the time I'm right here, I'm going to start going for the bottom, meaning chopping all the way down until I get right to that line. Now I forgot to do something, so I'm going to put that back in. I'm going to grab a Sharpie, and I'm going to put a line on the back of my chisel as a depth gauge. So I'm lining it up with the end lap, and then right here, fill that in. So when I'm to the line, I'm down to depth. All right, now, let's see if we can make all this make sense. I always chop so that I can see plumb. So Jake, you stand back there and look straight at me, please. If I chop like this, I have no idea where plumb is. But if I chop like this, I can see plumb and avoids serious undercutting. I also, I keep my back straight, I just spread my legs so that I can lower myself down. Now I'm gonna come in here, and like I said, that first one is going to be relatively small, a relatively small bite. Now if you look on this side, you may not be able to see it, but what happens is the fibers have a tendency to break out ahead of the tip of the chisel. So if I were to go full depth right now, I would most likely end up breaking out fiber beyond the end lap, and that's no good. So I'll go down, as a rule, I go about two-thirds of the depth, and I'll maintain that amount until I get about one-third of the way toward this baseline. Take small bites, they're much easier to manage, the fibers just have a tendency to crumble. If you take heavy bites, your chisel gets stuck, you got to wail on the thing. Okay, now from this point, till I get to the baseline, I'm going to try to go deeper with each successive chop. Rather than try to get there all at once, as you go deeper with each chop, it just makes it a little easier on the next chop because there's a little bit of relief area that you've created for the waste. So I gotta hurry up because I'm uh, I'm still almost an eighth of an inch away. And I'll divide this one in two. Not quite at the bottom, meaning depth as opposed to the horizontal version of the bottom. Okay, at this point, I've removed enough material because waste on that side pushes on the bevel and forces the chisel to go this way. I do not want to go below my baseline. So I've removed enough that there's very little waste left. I can drop my chisel right in the gauge line Hold it plumb and go to depth. Okay. By the way, when you're doing this, just make sure you're not chopping over one of these dog holes because uh, you need the support of the wood fiber. You'll end up going right down through and breaking out your end lap. All right, now, the rest of them we'll try to speed up a little bit. Two-thirds depths, small bite, another small bite, that was probably a little more than two-thirds, but still not all the way down. 
hit that chisel like you mean it. Now here's an opportunity to promote my mallet. So I have a friend, Sean, Sean Mahaffey, and he he gets us the mallet heads. They come, we get as a block, and it gets resin impregnated. So they put it in a vacuum chamber. After First of all, they cook it or heat it up to get the moisture content as close to zero as possible. Then they put it in a vacuum chamber with a polymer resin. And as the air comes out of the pores in the wood, it has to be replaced by something, and that's where the resin goes in. And then I think they cook it again. So when they're done, it increases the weight by about 40%, but it makes the wood really hard. And uh, I, I, I hate those rubber type mallets because you want the mallet to deliver. You don't want it to absorb. So it's a nice, good, solid feel. I prefer this style of mallet. Even though my friend Ahmed makes beautiful mallets that are almost too pretty to use, but gorgeous. He made these and donated one to every vet in our, in our last uh, group of classes. Every student, that's right too. He gave one to everybody. Generous Californian. All right, I'm right on the line, full depth. All right, one more to blast through. This is probably the most time consuming part of the process. Something else, or habit you want to get into is when it comes time to freeing the chisel, you always want to pry away, never against. And I'll elaborate on that when I get to the baseline. No need to clamp your board down. You're pounding straight down so it's not pushing the board left or right. Force is all vertical. Okay, that needs a little bit more. Now we set that in the gauge line. Now if it's jammed and I pull it this way, I'm going to bruise that nice sharp line. Nice sharp edges are what make for a, a good looking joint. Probably doesn't impact the strength of it at all, but it certainly distracts from the appearance. So if you get two sharp edges and you put them together, it results, let's see if we can't do that a little bit better, it results in what looks like a nice tight joint. But if you were to round that over, I don't think I have an example, but if, no, for the sake of an object lesson, let's do it. So a minute that gets rounded over at all, and then you put the two pieces together, now you end up with a very noticeable gap. So you gotta protect those nice sharp edges. Okay, that part's done. Now we're gonna go in and remove the waste. So here's how I do this. I hold my chisel, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use two chisels here, my half blind that Jake makes. We have these on our site. Check that top, my top left-hand corner. I'll have put the links on there. For those of you needing retail therapy, now I hold it like this, my thumb on the top, and I just lean on it in order to provide the pressure required. And this is another one of those situations where the smaller the chunks you take out, the less effort required, the less effort required, the more control you have. So now I've essentially got a, a U shape that has to be removed. So I'm going to come in here and just carefully nibble away at that. If you take little tiny bites, they break off and they clear out easy. And yeah, you might have to take 10 times more chops, but 
if you're going in there and and trying to take out big chunks and it and it's uh jamming up your chisel you're going to wish you had done it this way i'm being very careful not to hit the edge of that this pin okay now here's another lesson because because we chopped all the way full depth when we did this even though I've got solid material here I'm gonna fall into a void and it makes it really easy if you don't do that and, and that if I hadn't done that and that fiber gets all I, in other words it's still intact down there you get this corner that just becomes very difficult you got to come at it from the top you got to cut them at it from the bottom and it takes a lot of extra work and effort so I chop down and then I twist prying against the inside bottom not up here near the top spitting on my wood good thing we live in the same house okay now I'm carefully removing as much of this waste as I can because when I finally come to putting my chisel in that end lap gauge line I don't want to risk or I want to lessen the risk that that end lap is going to get blown off remember waste on this side puts pressure on the bevel driving the chisel this way and I cannot afford to have that happen so I'll go in there and I'll really clean that up to the point where there's just a few fibers left Okay, now before I go any further, I'm going to take my half blind. I'm going to go in there. And if you do it the uh, traditional way, you skew chisels. Do we have one here, Jake, as a sample? Well, a skew chisel. Where? Right behind me? Over here? Nope. In here. Uh, any idea where? Over here? Oh yeah, okay. So here's a skew chisel. So it looks like a regular chisel and it's skewed on the angle, on the end. So if I was going to use the skew chisels, this is too wide obviously, I need a narrow one. You need a right skew to get into that corner. You need a left skew to get into that corner. No, you can't flip it over because the bevel's in the way. But the big problem is this. You are paring through end grain. It's going to be the harder, the hardest of all the cuts. If you're doing it like this, your line of force, you're pushing that way, but your line of force wants to be in that direction. So the biggest advantage, I think, to this chisel is my line of force stays straight on. I can get both corners with the same tool. It means I don't have to switch. But that line of force thing, I think, is a big deal. Okay, let me trade places. <laughs> now... At this point, I'm going to drop down, I'm going to put it right in there, and I want to make sure I can feel where it's engaged best I can. Keep the chisel standing plumb. And get right into those corners. Now I'll use this one. Now, when I'm actually doing this, without it being recorded, I would... I would do every step three times, just so that you're not spending so much extra time picking up tools. But I want to be able to teach this to you a couple of times, reinforce it. Okay. All right. Now I'm looking. Thank you. I'm looking at the corner, and I'm a, got a little bit of meat in there. So I'm just going to lay that up against this, and just allow myself to get right into the corner, and I can just pull back like that, and just pull that little bit of fiber out. Make sure this bottom corner is nice and clean. Now, Jake, if you can get in there, just a second, let me go in here. You always have to be careful. Ooh, I think I took a piece of wood out of there. Shoot. Check that and check that wall. That's where the Curve X10 made the cut. It's, it's not relatively clean, certainly clean enough for what we're doing with none of the extra work of having to go in there and pair across there ever so carefully. 
All right, let me get the other corner. Get my lamp. Just make sure it's nice and clean on the bottom. Same thing, I got a little bit of material in there to get rid of. I couldn't get right into the corner. Now, um, another step here. Take my, my marking gauge. It's still set. And I'm going to use that as a means of finding out if indeed that end wall is either plumb or slightly undercut. Now, here's the problem. If, if that end wall slopes this way and you put your joint together, as you start to tighten it up, it's going to pull, like it's going to drive the pin board back, tailboard, sorry, and open up a gap here. So you cannot afford to have that, that happen. That's why you go in and check it using your marking gauge, kind of like a router plane. But you also, that, you'll also notice that that will not get right into the corner. And there's usually a little strip of wood in there that's going to create all the havoc. So I go in just inside the top edge and just purposely undercut that corner a little bit to make sure there is no, or there aren't any fibers holding on, just wanting to cause havoc. Uh, is that nice and clean? Yeah. Okay. Now I'll do one more real quick and then I can do the last one off camera. Go in there and clean that out and then come in here. Multiple small chops, easily breaking those little fibers off. And then over here. How are we for time? 32. Remember to get as much material away from that gauge line before you decide to go sit in there and pare down. And by the way, when I'm doing this, to clear that, I'm lifting the chisel straight up, not prying. Again, I want to protect those outside edges. Not terribly worried about this. It's end grain, so it doesn't contribute to the strength of the joint. By the way, I have a nasty habit when I'm working, I'm always cleaning my chisel like this. You can't do that with this. We sharpen the sides so that you can slide underneath or more easily get underneath the fibers that are hung up on the side of the pin. If that's left blunt, maybe safer, but it doesn't work nearly as effectively. So that's the reason why you can't clean your chisel off, even though you've seen me do it a couple of times already. Okay, now when I'm satisfied that I've removed enough of that material, I'll set that in there and feel for when it sits in the gauge line right into the corner now come in that's pretty clean into the corner and just get that little bit out now you know what I just realized I should be doing before I do that I should be coming up here like this and using the point of that chisel to free that up so when I come in here and then go sideways I'm not doing what I did right there which is pulling a little bit of that fiber out now I'll go in and pare down that inside corner just to make sure Use my marking gauge slash router plane to make sure that that back wall is indeed plumb and or slightly undercut. And there's two nice clean sockets. I'll do the third one. Tomorrow when we film, we'll go and we'll, uh, we'll do that other one. Got it, got, it, got it done. I told you I was going to show you the whole thing, but I'll, I'll pass on one of them. And then we've got to 
we've got to um, figure out how I'm going to, I'll get all figured out, but I'll share it with you. Do our backs, they're half blind, they're through dovetails, they're really fast and easy. Okay, any uh, questions, put them in the comment section. Do me a favor, click on an ad every once in a while, that's how we YouTube people get paid. It has nothing to do with views, has nothing to do with subscribers. You'll see ads on there, and if somebody clicks on an ad, then we actually get paid a couple of cents every time. Don't plan to earn my living doing this, but it is a nice way to communicate. Okay, enjoy this. See you soon.